Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that warm introduction and the wonderful hospitality. I really appreciate being here today and the honor to speak with you a little bit about what we're doing at Aerospace. So um, at Aerospace, we're 3D printing electric vehicle kits using recycled PET plastic and a hardener additive. And so uh, we're looking to have the first prototype complete by the end of the year. So we're very excited about that. Uh, we have students that just arrived from the States to work with students that are already here at the location at Ormiston Junior College where we've been invited to build the large format 3D printer that will build the first prototype as a single monocoque piece. And um, after that piece has been printed, we're going to configure the vehicle at our offices in 40 Love Grove Crescent in Otara. And so um, a lot of people have wondered, well, you know, is this the first time that a vehicle has been 3D printed? And as you mentioned, it's been done before. So as I bring this down a little bit, pardon the uh, PDF, I might, it might slowly rise up every now and again. Um, this vehicle right here was called the Strati, and it was developed by a company called Local Motors. They put a design competition out. This was the selected design from that competition, and they worked with national laboratories in the United States and a company called Cincinnati Incorporated to develop a large format 3D printer to 3D print this vehicle as a single monocoque piece. And this is using ABS plastic and carbon fiber combination. And so all they did after the vehicle was printed was insert the components, insert the batteries, the motors, the controllers, the steering wheel, and all of that, and it drove on the roads. And so uh, this was in 2014. The uh, printer that was used was called the BAM printer, which is short for Big Area Additive Manufacturing. And uh, that printer uh, costs a million dollars. U.S. Yeah. So um, amongst those cost prohibitions um, might be amongst some of the reasons why this did not take off in terms of it being a manufactured vehicle that people can produce. There's certain costings that would need to come down to make vehicles that are 3D printed from plastics accessible to people. And so that's what we're doing. And so um, as I bring this down, this is a, a certain challenge that um, I've been sharing about for quite a bit. So a lot of beaches and oceans are littered with plastic just like this. And um, as I shared last September in Germany, there's a floating plume of plastic in the South Pacific the size of Greenland. There's another one in the North Pacific. There's one in the South Atlantic. There's one in the North Atlantic. There's one in the Indian Ocean. There's one in the Caribbean. And that's just what's floating on the surface, let alone what's underneath the waters. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of you may have seen uh, a diver who dove in Bali and videotaped himself underwater, and he showed all of this plastic floating around him right off the coast of Bali. And there was more plastic than fish. You know, that presents a major issue. I mean, it affects our food chain. I eat fish. But if the fish are dead before it's fished out of the water, I can't eat it. So it affects us in many ways. It affects the environment. It affects our oceans. And the plastic that often ends up in our landfill, because it not all gets recycled through river runoff, ends up in our oceans. So it's affecting us all, and the amount of plastics is growing every day. And these are a lot of bottles that you see, but there's also microplastics. And a lot of turtles, a lot of whales, a lot of fish mistake that plastic as food. So they ingest the food, and then they die, and that's affecting many ecosystems around the world. And there's no one solution that's going to solve it. We all have to come together to prevent the flow of these plastics into our oceans. And as you may have heard recently, uh, China, for quite some time, was accepting our waste plastics for many years. That came to an end just about a month ago. And the announcement was made before the end of last year that China was no longer going to accept waste plastics from New Zealand, along with many other countries. They said, we're not going to be the, the waste basket of the world. You're going to have to do something with your plastics or reduce 
the amount of plastics that you produce and, and end up tossing into landfill in other areas. So that's what we're looking to do at Aerospace. We're looking to inspire other companies to come together and utilize these plastics. And our particular resource is rec <coughs> recycled PET plastic and combine that with a hardener additive. And if other companies are inspired to do likewise, then together we can make a dent in reducing what we see here. And so there's other pictures that you know, show that likewise. And um, I thought about how that can happen. So back in 2011, I met a gentleman by the name of Douglas Malawicki. And Douglas Malawicki, back in 1980, he developed this vehicle. This vehicle is called the California Commuter. And it's a one-seater vehicle, three wheels, two wheels in the front, one wheel in the back. And uh, not your typical vehicle, as you, can, as you can see. This vehicle achieved the Guinness World Record in 1980 as he drove from Los Angeles to San Francisco, achieving 157 miles per gallon in 1980. There's not vehicles on the road that achieve this level of efficiency that was done 37, 38 years ago. Why is that? I think that if this was done in 1980 and he achieved another Guinness World Record the following year using diesel, then why can't we achieve these levels of efficiency today? I believe we can. And it's very easy to do. The technologies all are already there. It's just a matter of putting those technologies together at work to achieve that particular cause. And so um, we met in 2011. We were both keynote speakers at an event in Santa Ana, California. Uh, his talk was on super trains. He's developed a system called SkyTran. It's been on the covers of popular science and popular mechanics. It's basically a levitated pod that is magnetically levitated on a track that's above the pod to transport you from one place to the city to another. You just swipe your card, tell the computer where you want to go, and it drops you off at the nearest point. And um, the queue waits for you instead of you waiting for it. So uh, there's lines of these pods that just come up, and then you just get on and ride to your destination. My topic was on super planes. And after the talks, we got together, and he said to me, why don't we do an electric version of what I did back in 1980 is what Doug said to me. And I said, I'd be more than happy to help you with that. So that's where the idea of developing an electric version of this came from. And I thought, well, after 2014, I heard about local motors and their vehicle and how they used ABS plastic. I said, well, if they used ABS plastic and carbon fiber, I can do something similar to 3D print and produce a revolution in the manufacturing process in automobiles. Shortly after I arrived to New Zealand in 2015, I met a gentleman by the name of Chris Keenan in Devonport. He has a company called 4D Canvas, and through a mutual business acquaintance, he invited me to his home. I accepted, and he said, no, no, no. You don't want to use ABS plastic. I got something for you that's a lot better than that. And he introduced me to PET plastic. And that PET plastic that he used for a 3D printer in his home didn't release noxious fumes as ABS plastic does when you melt it down. That's one of the challenges. In addition to that, the PET plastic was recycled PET plastic from a company called Enofil that was based in the Netherlands. And they're producing recycled PET plastic filament for 3D printers. Now, I said, well, great. And he showed me pieces, and they were very strong. But I knew that if we were going to tackle that issue that I just showed to you earlier about reducing waste plastics that end up in our oceans, we're going to have to come up with a process that's a lot simpler, that doesn't involve all of the refinements that Enofil does to produce its filament. We have to do something that's faster, that's easier. And so using recycled PET plastic that's already around the world, I don't think there's a country that doesn't have you know, fizzy bottles and water bottles. And so why not make use of plastic locally? So, um, we got together and we decided to go ahead and make it out of recycled PET plastic. This is a mock-up version. This is um, fiberglass body here. But um, this was around um, 2013 when we got together. That's myself, the gentleman who stored this uh, mock-up version of what would be uh, the drop later on. 
This is Joe Valencic. Um, he's a world-class oceanographer and um, electrical engineer. Um, he actually conducts classes while he's diving and he videos the class and shoots it into the classroom. So the students actually see him in the water sharing about ocean life and things like that. Absolutely fantastic person. Again, his name is uh, Joe Valencic. And uh, this is Al Timmons, and he's a composite specialist. And he works for a company called the Spaceship Company. Uh, that may ring a bell. The Spaceship Company is a company that has been contracted by Virgin Galactic to build their spacecraft that are going to take tourists into space. So, um, so he works in Mojave Air and Spaceport in Mojave, California. Awesome group of people. You know, as far as the brains in, in this picture, you know, I don't par well with these folks, you know? And this is um, Douglas Malawicki uh, that's seated in the vehicle. And Douglas Malawicki, he's 79 now. Uh, for his 79th birthday, he ran 79 miles in three days. He's an ultra runner. And his daughter is a famous um, ultra runner as well. They do all these trails and stuff and literally run over 25 miles a day for three days straight. I can't do that, you know. So as far as the brains and the physical ability, you know, again, I'm probably, you know, I don't par well with this august group of people, you know. And I'm just privileged to, to work with them. And so just a few months ago, we had this brought over from uh, uh, Orange County to our offices here in Otora. So Doug Malawicki, he's a consultant now with Aerospace. So he's consulting us on the build of the drop. And this is the chassis that was in the California commuter that's at our offices. And this chassis we're going to be using as a test bed for the electrical power plant system and put it on a closed course over the next few months as the 3D printer is being built. At the same time, we'll be developing all the electrical components, testing it on here and seeing what initial numbers we get before we print the whole vehicle, including the chassis, out of recycled PET and a hardener additive. And we did some testing over at a location called Critical just last week. So uh, Critical is led by Rui Peng. Uh, some of you may be familiar with him. He turns plastics into furniture. And so he, along with many other people here in Auckland, are very passionate, along with myself, about making use of waste plastics so that they don't end up in our landfills and that through river runoff, they don't end up in our oceans. And I think all of us can do a little bit to help that effort. And so we did some testing of uh, that material and it came out very well for this vehicle to eventually be built later on this year. So this is the drop and as you see that chassis design has been integrated into using SOLIDWORKS the vehicle itself. So a gentleman by the name of Innocent Chikorema, uh, he's a um, very astute 3D modeler and this really incorporates a lot of what we're here talking about, right? Technology and how we can apply technology and skill to achieve certain goals. Um, he integrated that chassis into the body here and we've kind of updated the vehicle, if you will, a little bit. It doesn't have that wing in the back, you know, like it's out of Buck Rogers, you know what I'm saying, you know? So, uh, so we've kind of brought the, the design elements uh, a little bit up to speed, if you will. And um, again, two wheels in the front, one wheel in the back. We're looking to have the uh, batteries underneath the occupant and have the uh, motor uh, operating the, the rear wheel, putting torque on the ground uh, using lithium iron phosphate batteries. And uh, there's a reason why we decided to go with lithium iron phosphate as opposed to your standard lithium ion batteries because lithium ion batteries contain a material called cobalt. And cobalt is mined in areas of the world that the environmental regulations for the workers are very low, if not non-existent. And so you have people seven, eight, nine years old doing mining in cobalt mines and are not treated with the decency that I feel that they should be treated with. So that's why we decided to go with batteries that don't contain cobalt in there in terms of not necessarily supporting uh, that particular type of, of mining. And so they don't have as much energy density as lithium ion batteries do, but due to the efficiency of the vehicle, 
we're not really concerned about that because by our calculations, we should receive an excess of 321 kilometers per charge. And that's only using 7.8 kilowatt hours of battery life. So to compare that, uh, Tesla, for example, has over 100 kilowatt hours in its battery pack. And, uh, and so we'll be able to drive from Hamilton and back to Auckland on one charge using a fraction of that due to the efficiency of the vehicle. Some of the efficiency comes from its aerodynamics. Uh, as you see, it's rounded in the front and tapers in the back. That reduces the aerodynamic drag. Um, a lot of hatchbacks are here in, in New Zealand. I see a lot, uh, you know, back when I was in Los Angeles as well. The thing about uh, vehicles that have a flat rear is that people think that aerodynamics is determined from what the front of the vehicle looks like. But when, as the air is going around the vehicle, it holds on to that flat area in the back and grabs it and basically pulls the vehicle from behind, forcing the engine to work harder to go a certain velocity. So rather than that, let's maintain the laminar flow of the vehicle to reduce that aerodynamic drag. Another efficient measure is its light weightness. So in total, the vehicle should only weigh about 150 kilos by our calculations. And that's 75% components about 75% material weight in the body. So the, uh, three, the 3D printer extruder that we're looking to use from a company called Wegner, located in Germany, releases its plastic material at a rate of about six kilos per hour, meaning that with about 75 kilos total in material weight, we should be able to print a body in about 12 hours or so. And so um, that is another amazing development that we can do at a fraction of the cost of that band printer that we mentioned earlier that was a million dollars US minimum without your shipping and handling, you know what I mean? So, uh, so the original idea was to bring one of those over here, but you know, that was a little cost prohibitive. So we, um, two of my uh, interns, and there have been various interns that have been working with us. We've had interns that have worked with us from New Zealand School of Education when I first arrived here. Uh, to New Zealand back in September 2015. We have um, interns from AUT. We have interns from Manukau Institute of Technology. And uh, we have um, also uh, interns from various other institutions. And at Massey, two of my interns said, we can build our own 3D printer as a, at a fraction of the price as uh, the BAM printer developed by Cincinnati Incorporated. So one of those interns actually designed a 3D printer in order to do that, and we're looking to convert a CNC router over the next two months with the students that have arrived from the United States to build that at Ormiston Junior College. And so uh, you can kind of see uh, why we've given it the name The Drop. <laughs> yeah, it has a, a teardrop shape to it, and um, it helps us uh, really improve, as mentioned before, the aerodynamics. So um, this extruder machine uh, was, this photo was the picture of uh, the testing that was done at Critical uh, just uh, last week at Wesley Intermediate in Mount Roskill. So um, that was an awesome time. Rui uh, and Andy, uh, the uh, business owners of Critical, which is incubating at Wesley Intermediate, provided us the ability to use their uh, material extrusion machine, and this is um, recycled PET plastic. And we put it into the extrusion machine, and it came out with the hardener additive that we sprinkled in, and we have some fantastic results that have come from that. Very strong material. And so uh, we're very excited about these outcomes. And um, we last May visited uh, Scion Research, May of last year, in Rotorua and they proposed uh, testing to be done to further validate that testing of the uh, ratio between the hardener additive and the recycled PET plastic. And so in sharing about this with um, a competition called Next Visionaries put on by BMW and Ted, um, out of a few hundred applicants, I was named one of the top six last year to fly to Frankfurt, Germany to give a TED talk at the Frankfurt Motor Show, and that was a great honor. And so I had the privilege of being on stage and sharing about the plight of oceans 
collecting all of this plastic and what we can do to stem that and curb that and provide some solutions that can inspire, hopefully, others to do likewise. And um, a great group of people. Uh, we were mentored by you know, awesome previous TED Talk um, individuals. And on the BMW stage, I had the privilege to share about the drop. And it's a wonderful honor, and it's really gained a lot of notoriety between then and now. And we're really excited about moving forward over this next five, six months, where we're looking to uh, do test runs on the vehicle if all goes well uh, uh, in the, the very near future. So um, as you could probably gather, it really takes a team to uh, put together a lot of what we've done. And a lot of people were sharing with me about, you know, well, if you share this idea, could somebody just take that idea and run with it and things like that? And um, my approach was very different. I, my response to them was, I'm not worried about that. Number one, if somebody takes that idea and runs with it and it becomes a success and it helps curb the issues that are affecting us daily, then I'm not even all that worried about that. I, I'd love to see other companies do what it is that we're doing, even in the transportation space. That's fine by me. But in addition to that, one thing that I learned and that I hope that a lot of our mentees understand as well is that in sharing your dream and vision, you help draw people to what you're doing. People can't be drawn to what you're doing and take part in it if they don't know about it. So I inspire and hopefully share with individuals to share with the right people what your dream is. And almost everyone in this room, I'm sure, has a dream that they have either fulfilled or are looking to fulfill. And share it with the right people who can, if not be a part of what you're doing, refer you to the right people to join you on that particular journey. And that's the approach that we did. So um, Camillus uh, Sangha and um, Kuda, there were the two students from Massey uh, that interned with me that I made mention of um, earlier. Uh, he developed a, a drone that we're looking to uh, uh, build in the very near future, Camillus did, and Kuda was the one that designed the 3D printer that we're using as the basis for the 3D printer large format that we'll be building at Ormiston Junior College. And so um, here is um, Dr. Neil Pandy. And so a lot of people are saying, well, how are you able to form it, these relationships with these individuals to help you along with what it is that you're doing? And there's two answers to that. One is that I was willing to just walk in the door. So our office is at 40 Love Grove Crescent, which is the location of nonprofit Accelerating Aotearoa made mention of earlier. We've been working with Accelerating Aotearoa led by Judy Spate uh, since my wife and I arrived to New Zealand. And uh, in geek camps and park jams, we've been sharing about the principles of flight to young kids where they've actually designed their own aircraft. It's been a pleasure doing things like that. Just in the past um, holiday session, uh, we, we taught kids robotics and how to build their own robots. And they did that. And it's awesome the creativity and the ability that students have if they understand that there's individuals that be believe in what they're doing and what they are capable of. And so, Dr. Neil Pandey, I just walked into Manukau Institute of Technology last year and I said, you know what, can you uh, share with perhaps some members of the staff what it is that we're working on and we are able to mentor uh, your students because we have engineers on board our team that can offer that mentorship. And uh, the individuals at MIT referred me to Dr. Neil Pandey, who's the head of engineering at M MIT. And um, he asked me to talk with his students. So he invited me. I talked with the whole engineering uh, student body at MIT, and many of them were very excited about doing projects related to the drop. And last year, over half of the engineering students at MIT were doing projects related to the drop. And so um, that's the staff there behind him. Um, over at our offices in, in Weotora, which is the name of the uh, location where my business has been able to incubate. And if not for Judy Spade and accelerating out to Roa, we wouldn't be anywhere near where we are. You know, people really enjoy when there's a place that people can call home and really can come to and meet with you about things. And uh, that's what accelerating out to Roa has provided for us. You know, I had a love of sharing 
with kids, science, technology, engineering, and math. Back when I was in Los Angeles, my wife and I volunteered for a nonprofit called A Man, which inspired young kids to pursue the sciences, uh, primarily in aviation and aerospace. And prior to arriving to New Zealand, we connected those two organizations together, my wife and I did. So as soon as we stepped foot here in New Zealand, we were off and running, sharing with young people the wonders of technology, which is exactly what you're doing here at Tech School. Question. I'm also on the board of Iokira. Absolutely right. <laughs> Absolutely right. Like, yeah. Uh, I've worked with Judy for the last 10 years as well. Absolutely. Yeah, on the board and supporting her since she was at, it used to be called Accelerating Auckland. Yes. And then it changed to Iokira. Absolutely. Absolutely right. And it was through Judy that I was introduced to New Zealand School of Education. Yes. Yeah. And so um, it, it's a wonderful relationship that, again, would not take place if people aren't willing to share their ideas and work together. And so um, these are some of the um, engineers that have been working with us. This is Innocent. Uh, he was the one that did the 3D modeling on the drop. Um, he's worked with many companies such as Reynolds, um, not too far from here, because we're in Avondale, so literally just about five minutes from here. Um, and um, fantastic uh, 3D modeler. Um, this is uh, Anvita Basaria, uh, who is uh, an expert in um, sustainable economics. And she just recently uh, moved to Australia, but she had been very critical in helping us formulate uh, how to integrate what we're doing into a circular economy, where when you produce a vehicle, such as the drop, even after its life of use, it doesn't have to go to landfill. And it can be completely recycled because we are looking for our materials to be thermoplastic, which means you can reuse it again. So you can make another vehicle out of it or you can do something else with it. You know, we don't have to have this uh, use and waste culture that is um, affluent all around the world. We can change that in order to make better use of the resources that are around us and be good stewards of this earth that we've been given. Um, this young lady right here, she is a 10 plus year um, expert in sensor engineering. And so she's mentoring sensor students uh, in the engineering uh, program. And there's a slew of other individuals whom, you know, I probably gasp for, for breath in being able to name. Um, here are many of the core people with um, accelerating Aotearoa. Uh, this is Judy Spate, um, AOI from uh, Good Seed Trust. Uh, this is um, Sully Paella. Uh, he's known as the, the grandfather of Otara, is his nickname. Uh, he's done work in service of the Otara community for decades. As a matter of fact, we Otara at 40 Love Grove Crescent used to be where he um, based a lot of his work prior to uh, founding Cross Power. Uh, in, in um, Otara and um, New Zealand School of Education. <laughs> Absolutely, right here. And, and, and it, it was her who introduced me to the wonderful people here at NZSE. You know, it's been a wonderful, wonderful relationship. And so, um, you know, fantastic group of people we have here. Uh, Coconut Wireless, uh, Mary Alway who's really helped promote what it is that we're doing through social networking. And really, it takes a team to work together to accomplish these goals. I think I might have mentioned that a few minutes ago, you know, yeah, just to reiterate that, that point, that you know, it's not one person or two people alone or, or a small group that can do it. It takes a lot of people working together. This was um, uh, the geek camp that just took place uh, during the recent holiday camp, and so uh, this Young gentleman right here, that's Jada Quinn, uh, a resident of Otara, and he put together that robot through um, Vex Robotics through the company called KiwiBots. So uh, KiwiBots, um, led by Chris Hamlin, um, he helps host competitions throughout New Zealand, uh, Vex Robotics constructor sets to accelerating Aotearoa. And we've used those to teach robotics and programming to the kids. And out of all of the different types of robots that can be built using that constructor set, they built the most complex one, 
which is called stretch, I guess due to the rubber bands and stuff like that. And so, uh, and so you know, he practically built that robot all on his own, although there were a couple of others where two or three students got together, he did it himself. And so somebody might assume that young people uh, from um, underrepresented communities don't have the abilities in order to exercise their God-given talents and abilities to do creative things and use their mind for technical pursuits, but we know that not to be true, right? If somebody's willing to inspire them and, and let them know that they can do it, they oftentimes exceed your expectations. Um, this young gentleman, that's Elijah, also put together an awesome bot and programmed them as well. So they learned programming on how the robots move where you don't even need a controller. They input the programming through the drag and drop program that comes with the Kiwi bots in terms of showing the, and telling the robot how to turn and at what speed and to move forward and to move back. So they learned the basics of programming along with building the robots from the ground up as well. Um, these are individuals from a company called Emergia. So in terms of putting together a kit that somebody can put themselves together in 20 hours or less, it really requires visualizing the vehicle. And so uh, the team over at Immersia um, at the ARVR garage in Mount Eden, um, they said, you know what? We can offer you the ability to engage with uh, customer base in terms of how to build the vehicle. Because if somebody doesn't have you know, a lot of technical expertise, if they don't feel like they can put a vehicle together that they themselves are going to drive on the road, then they're not going to buy the vehicle when we look to bring it to the market around this time next year. And so in terms of instructions, yeah, we can do videos, but they say we can do something even better than that. If you look on your phone and you da you've downloaded the Immersia browser, you can look at this area right here, raise your phone up to it, and the vehicle is right there. And you, you can, the vehicle can blow up in terms of its respective parts. It can be expanded and collapsed in various stages of the build. You can see how to put the vehicle together. And that's some of the technology that would be necessary to give people the, the comfortability in knowing that they can build the vehicle themselves. And me, being a sociology major, can do the same. So um, yeah, that's another picture of the team there. Um, this was at the EV World last year, where we got together to share with a lot of people around about what we're doing. Uh, we have our first sponsor, Friendly Pack, and they do compostable products. The head of Family Pack, Friendly Pack, he um, used to work in plastics. Um, that's uh, Kevin Graham, the founder of Friendly Pack, and um, he he has, in a way, contributed. And he takes ownership for a lot of the situations regarding plastics entering our oceans. And so he has made a concerted effort to say, you know what? I had a role in plastics being used in almost every um, soda company in the world. I want to offer some solutions. And so he's developed this company called Friendly Pack that introduces sustainable and compostable uh, packaging, which is absolutely awesome. And so we're honored to work with, with Kevin, and he's a Awesome guy, fantastic individual. This gentleman right here, that's Doug Malawicki, the gentleman I mentioned earlier, the 79-year-old ultra runner. And so um, he visited us um, last year uh, when I was honored to host one of the um, Callahan Innovation Forums that takes place in Auckland every two or three months. And so in hosting one, I said, you know what? I know a guy who might be a great speaker for you guys. And so um, uh, he was visiting also his daughter around that time. So we were able to work because his daughter lives here in, in New Zealand, Mirawai Beach. And so we said, you know what, Doug, come and talk with um, folks here at Callahan Innovation and other entrepreneurs learning to gain some inspiration in various ways about what it is that you're doing. And so Doug came and visited us. He met with members of the team. Um, and it's just a, a fantastic relationship. I just, uh, we're, we're working with Igor and Angela just earlier today at another event that I came from there straight here uh, that was in the CBD to help raise capital for this venture. So it's been 
awesome relationships that have been formulated with awesome individuals, um, interns, scientists, ATED. It's just awesome groups of people here. So the third reason why the vehicle is efficient in addition to its aerodynamics and in addition to its lightweight is the efficiency technology that is demonstrated in it. So late last year, we merged with a company called REPS, uh, which is short for Regenerative Electrical Power Systems Incorporated. So that's why I like saying REPS. <laughs> this circuit is called the efficiency circuit. And this efficiency circuit improves the efficiency of end applications such as lighting by producing a wave where the end application is basically reading the upper crest of the wave rather than the whole wave. And that wave pattern, that sine wave, is happening so fast that basically end applications such as lighting are able to operate at a fraction of the electricity that is normally considered the standard for that industry. So um, I brought the circuit with me. And I'd like to demonstrate it for you. So um, this is the input, even though it says output here. Somebody flipped the wording there. It wasn't me. So, and then um, the, the output is there. So this right here is a 100 watt LED. And a 100 watt LED normally requires 27 to 36 volts to light up. Usually anything less than that, it does not light up. And many, very few people have even seen LEDs that are this big. Normally you see maybe a 10 watt LED. A 100 watt LED is not really seen that much is because behind the LED, you usually have to have major heat sinks and thermal management systems because the diode gets very hot. A lot of people think that LEDs don't get hot. Well, they may not get hot on the front, on the illumination side, but I, I can tell that some people in the room understand that it gets very hot in the back. And so you have to have these active cooling fans and heat sinks and stuff like that going on. But with the technology, not only does it allow the LED to run efficient, but it also keeps the LED from getting hot. So you don't need all those active thermal management systems and cooling fans and all of that. So um, this right here is eight AA batteries, 1.5 volts each battery, so 12 volts in total, which is less than half of what is required to light up this light. And so here we have the efficiency circuit wrapped in some beautiful carbon fiber that looks less than beautiful. <laughs> so um, uh, as you can imagine, there were some um, measures to make sure that it was difficult to get into the contents if me and my absent-mindedness might misplace it or something. So this right here is the efficiency circuit that came from uh, REPS based in Los Angeles um, since REPS has merged with Aerospace. So, what we'll do is we'll we have a volunteer. Is there a volunteer that can maybe come up and help me out here? Yes, come on up. Come on up, Priya. Let's give Priya a hand. Awesome. How you doing, Priya? Good, thanks. Good, good. Um, Priya and I, we were on the bus, and we got off trying to cross the street from that over here. And so she said, do you want to hide under my umbrella? I said, yes, I would like to hide under your umbrella, and as it was uh, uh, sprinkling a bit. So thank you for picking that up. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to connect these. So let's do um, positive to positive and negative to negative right here. So red to red and black to black. You can plug it in. You'll be all right. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was just at um, a Chinese delegation forum earlier today um, over at the Pullman Hotel. And I demonstrated the circuit for, for one of the, um, the businesses represented. And um, one of the ladies got a little nervous. She's like, you know, didn't know what was going to happen. But um, I think we've demonstrated these enough times to know that we're going to be OK. okay. So again, 
Anyone can look up that it takes 27 volts or more to light up this LED. Go ahead and flip the switch there. There you go. That's the one. Again, um, nothing I could take credit for. I'm just the delivery man, you know? But um, basically, the combination of technologies can solve a lot of world problems. You know, this can be utilized in indoor lighting. It can be utilized in mobile devices, laptops, computers, this type of technology that is in my hands here. So this light has been on for maybe 15, 20 seconds or so and it's continuing to light bright, if the amount of energy normally required to light this light was used to light this light without the circuit, my hand would be burning right now. I mean, it'd be barbecue time. <laughs> Talk about sausage sizzle, right? <laughs> but I'm OK. You can go ahead and hold that. How does it feel? Cold. Right. And so um, you don't need the thermal management systems to knock the fans, which oftentimes is a further energy drain, right? And then the heat that is not collected in the end LED, neither is it in the, the component itself, the circuit. Do you feel any heat or anything? Or? Yeah. It's all cold and normal. Right. So, and it can run for an indefinite period of time, so long as there's something to power it. So we're not talking about... Um, you know, what do they, what do they call it, um, um, perpetual motion machines or anything like that. We need an energy source, right? And so, um, you know, I'm very excited to introduce technologies like this in the vehicles that we're developing because the consumers of this technology could be the very companies that are also in the automobile industry developing electric vehicles. Let's help improve their efficiency. Let's help improve their range. And the developer of the technology has been able to run motors as well as lighting. So um, we had this test done at National Instruments just a couple of months ago, uh, located in Mount Eden, which validated the results. So Nas National Instruments is well known for having data acquisition software. And Stuart Little, who's over um, National Instruments New Zealand, oversaw the testing and can validate the results of this technology working. So thank you very much. Let's give Priya a hand, everybody. Awesome. Yeah. Um, there's even an additional benefit to that circuit and that LED, which is if, if I had a, a glass that's wide enough, um, we can actually dip that LED as it's operating into the water, into a conductive environment, and because of the wave pattern and the type of electricity that's going into the end application, it doesn't short. So um, you know, maybe another time. <laughs> but you know, before, before everybody came, I was like, can this fit in here? Yeah. But, um, but yeah, again, as I mentioned before, the technologies are there. It's just a matter of putting together the technologies layer by layer to formulate solutions to a lot of problems that face us today. So you may come across solutions to problems that you see in everyday life. You know, What are those solutions that you have? And are you willing to work with people that can help further your solutions so that this world can be a better one than the one that you stepped into? These are students at uh, Ormiston Junior College. I had the privilege of demonstrating uh, the circuit there and um, wonderful group of kids that are gonna be learning about 3D printing as we built a large format 3D printer there at Ormiston Junior College. And so wonderful relationships are being built in order to inspire the next generation to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and math, which is exactly what you're doing here at tech school and it's a privilege and an honor to be here today thank you so much for the invitation and i really appreciate your time thank you very much